All right, we are live. Okay, to everyone who is here and has already seen an event at the Catamaran Writing Conference Virtual Reading and Lecture Series, welcome back. To everyone who has not yet, welcome for the first time. I'm Matt Simmons, and I'm the conference manager for this reading series uh, this year. We weren't able to have our conference as we normally would at the beautiful Stevenson campus on 17 Mile Drive a year, um, which is a seven year tradition that we have. And we will be having it again there next year from July 25th to July 29th, 2021. So if you want to register for that, you can right now on the Catamaran website. Let's go and do that. We don't want to wait a year to become connected with the poets and writers around Catamaran. So we have a series of talks and readings lined up um, all on Crowdcast here. So if you click on Catamaran Literary Reader, you can see the list of those. Um, we started on Sunday with Jane Smiley. Yesterday, we turned to poetry with Zach Rogow, Joe Millar, and Susan Brown did readings. Um, earlier today, for fiction, we had Karen Joy Fowler. And all of these previous talks, you can also find uh, video recordings of on Crowdcast. So if you, again, click on Catamaran Literary Reader, you can go and scroll down to past events and watch the videos of the recordings of. On Wednesday, though, we're going to turn to nonfiction. So tomorrow, make sure to tune in for that. We have Neil Snydow, Joan Staffin, Charles Hood, and Dan White, who are going to speak. Um, and we really hope you'll join us for those. If you want longer descriptions, again, you can click on Catamaran Literary Reader and read about that. But right now, we have Josip Nabokovic. He has published a dozen books, including five story collections, three collections of narrative essays, two books of practical criticism, and the novel April Fool's Day, which has been translated into 10 languages. He is the recipient of the Whiting Writers Award, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and in 2013 was a Man Booker International Award finalist. His novel, Rubble of Rubles, is scheduled for publication in 2021. And after him, Lisa will be reading, Lisa Fugard will be reading as well. But before we get to all this, let me explain a little of how Crowdcast works. So the bottom there, we have a button that says buy their books. If you click that, that is going to take you to the Catamaran Book Fair, where you can buy signed copies of Yosip and Lisa's books. And that is very helpful. So go ahead and click that at some point. Also, really important, ask a question at the bottom. If you click ask a question, you can ask a question, or if you just want to suggest a topic, something for them to talk to each other about for a while after the readings, do that as well. That's really helpful. It lets us you know, get the conversation to something that interests you. But now I'm going to turn it over to Yosep, and he is going to do a reading. Thank you, Yosep. Oh, thanks. Um, so uh, this is a short story. Uh, it has two titles, uh, alternate uh, tumbleweed or Russian thistle. Sleepy from spending a night at a truck stop near Rapid City, I stood on the shoulder of Interstate 90 with my thumb up. The pickup braked, its tires squealed and smoked. I climbed into the truck and faced a drooping blonde mustache and weathered skin under a leather hat with a snake brim. A black gun on the seat made me hesitate. I didn't shut the door behind me. What are you waiting for? You aren't, you aren't Iranian, are you? No. My feet crunched through a bunch of empty cans and fumbled over a hunting rifle. At first sight, I thought you were. I, I, I'm not going to stop for some Iranian shithead. But then I thought, so what if he's an Iranian? I could blow his brains out. But you aren't Iranian? No, I'm glad to say. Have a beer then. Where are you going? New York. I could take you to Iowa, uh, I-80, would that be fine? Tremendous. I'm driving to Missouri to visit my old man. It's lonely down there, so I'm taking him a toy. He pointed uh, at a gray snowmobile, snowmobile in the back of uh, the pickup. I glanced at, at uh, the gun. Oh, this thing, don't worry about it. It's for rattlesnakes, hypnotizes them. Just keep it circling in front of their eyes, their heads follow. Once the sucker's got the rhythm, you pull the trigger. It blows the bust like a tomato. He offered me a can. I slid my thumbnail beneath the opener and the smell of yeast popped up. For a while we didn't talk. On one side of the road, a field of wavy alfalfa seemed to spin clockwise 
another herd of Angus cows rotated counterclockwise. Brown clouds of dust made the horizon hazy. Little dry, wiry bushes like skeletons of globes bounced over the road and collected uh, on the fences alongside. What are these weeds? Russian thistle. You've got an accent. Uh, where did you say you came from? Your aunt from Iran? Yugoslavia. How, how do you like it here? Much better than Czechoslovakia, isn't it? I imagine it is. I've never been to Czechoslovakia, he said. Neither have I. Man, don't you joke like that with me. You just told me you are a Czecho. No, Yugoslav, Yugoslav. Well, how did you get out? Simple. Cut the electrical wires with a pair of scissors, swam across the, the river Drava into Austria, took gunfire the whole way. I considered pulling up the sleeve of my T-shirt to pass off my smallpox vaccine, vaccine scars as bullet wounds. Oh, at least in this country we have democracy, he said. I leaned over the speedometer, staring at the hand that trembled around 90. Don't worry. I don't believe in cups. Dig me a beer out of the cooler. Grab one for you. We drank more than a case of beer and then, for refreshment, stepped, stopped at a pitch dark country bar and had a couple of shots of Jack Daniels. He kept laughing that he was on the road with a comet. From Yugoslovakia. It's pretty cold in Yugoslovakia, isn't it? No, Yugoslavia is on the Mediterranean, I said. Shit, the Russians have got that far. He took off his hat, wiped his white forehead with a red handkerchief, but half a dozen Minnesotans at the bar insisted they have a double shot of vodka so I wouldn't feel too far from home. Back in his pickup, uh, he swallowed a white pill and gave me one too. Amphetamines, a good invention, helps you drink more. A black Corvette passed us. He sped up to 110 and, and, and uh, passing the Corvette made the international fucking sign. Nobody passes me. I mean, nobody. Have you got a ticket? I said. Instead of answering, he opened his right palm. I popped a can and placed it in it. So how come you got no wheels? He asked me sympathetically, perhaps mentioning that I was stripped off my license for heroic driving. Oh, too much time at school. I said, uh, hoped I'd save enough money this summer working in the oil fields, except I couldn't find enough work. He, and he said, you should have run into me before. I run rigs in Montana. What work can you do? Oh, I'm just a worm. That's okay. You, you could make a Derek man pretty fast if you aren't uh, scared of heights. A little over time, you'd be cracking 80 grand a year. Make about 100, more than a fucking dentist in Minneapolis. Must be great feeling, all those bucks. Better than getting laid. Well, I, I don't know. I couldn't compare. I haven't got laid since Ford was president. And I haven't ever made money. A green and white Iowa sign loomed uh, huge above us. A small black and white sign stood on the side of the road. Speed limit 55, mobile homes 50. So you study in New York? Yeah, Columbia. Don't shit me. That's a school for the rich brats. All you got is, is your useless dick. I do study there. What can I say? So you think you're smart? Can't get laid? Can do better than the uh, worm. A pink or Columbia. You tell that my grandma, okay? For a while we didn't talk. Then he said, I'm gonna crash somewhere around here. I don't know about you, but I'm wasted. Why don't you get out of here? He breaks suddenly, swerved on the shoulder and kneeled into the cornfield. I thought you'd get me to I-80. Get the fucking out of here. I barely had enough time to get my backpack out of the bed. My notebook fell out and slid under the snow snowmobile. The, the pickup started quickly, the tires shooting gravel and soil in low trajectories. 
And steady, I stuck my thumb up and looked around. A green Lamar's sign with a couple of rusty holes from bullets. The truck siren hooted at me like a lonely freight train. Uh, as I crossed the road uh, to the gas station, where I asked about a bus that could get me to I-80, the attendant ignored me while pumping uh, into a large Chevy filled with the, the wide, ruddy faces of an extended family. Is there a bus, st uh, a bus stop around here? No answer. So I asked, are there any Christians around here? The husky gas attendant looked at me, Christians, listen, if you don't uh, leave the premises right away, I'm going to call the cops. They're going to tell you all about Christians. I staggered into the motel and asked uh, about a single room for the night. $20.99, a little too much. By the way, it was $90.99 when, when it was money. Stepping out, I was blinded by bright lights. There were two police cars waiting, three or, or four cops with uh, beer ponches protruding authoritatively into the darkness outside the scope of the beams of light. Not happy with the limelight, I sidled sideways. Sir, stay put. There's been complaints about you. About me? How do you know it was about me? Driver's license, please. I'm not driving. We need to identify you. Okay, I've got a green card. Driver's license. You got to test you. Drunk as a skunk. Looks like it. I don't want to be tested. I'm drunk. I'm drunk. Isn't that good enough? Isn't the, isn't the freedom to get drunk the, at the root of democracy? Pursuit of personal happiness is guaranteed by the Constitution? Come, close your eyes, bring the tip of your index finger to your nose. I don't want to, I'm drunk. And so what? I bet uh, you lift one or two when, uh, yourself now and then when you get home after a dull day of work with your wife yawning in pajamas. Bring that finger to your nose. The cop was shouting. The other one clanked a pair of handcuffs. So I followed orders. It seemed to me I did a great job hitting my nose and only once my right eye. My eyeball hurt, but not too bad. All right, now walk the straight line, put one foot right in front of the other. I did that too, didn't fall. My assessment of the result uh, differed from theirs. The melody maker put the cuffs on my hands and two cuffs shoved me into a car. They turned on the siren and drove me around the town several times to brag about having caught a menace to the law and order. They led me into a police station doing a pretty good imitation of TV cops escorting a murderer. In the room, a thin investigator sitting behind the desk asked me to empty my pockets. He examined all the things on the table one by one as if he hadn't seen the likes. He found my registration, alien card, the so-called green card, fascinating. Don't you know it's illegal to be intoxicated in public? I don't. Don't you know it's illegal to hitchhike in Iowa? But how else are you going to get around if you can't afford a car? Are you discriminating against the poor? We are not a welfare department. For your own good, to protect you and others will put you in jail for the night until you sober up. He said that in a friendly voice, like a doctor sending a patient to a hot spring in, of, of, for a rheumatism cure. That made me feel good. And in the morning, you'll have to go to court and pay a fine. A fine? I have hardly any cash. I just have this check from working on a coal mine silos in Wyoming. Maybe you can get someone to wire you money. He said, turning my student ID over and cleaning his nails with it. Another cop came by and said, give me a belt and shoelaces. Shoelaces, so you don't kill yourself. I'm not depressed. Besides, my shoelaces are rotten. To demonstrate, tag, tag that one, which instantly snapped. 
See, you couldn't even hang a cat with this one. But there, there was no arguing. I, I had to untend my, sorry, surrender my shoelaces. Holding my biceps, a cup led me into a, an empty cell. Neon lights emanated from the ceiling. The faucet water was hot. It didn't alleviate my dehydration and headache. My bones, eyes, and I, I identified organs hurt when I lay down on the on the something that acted as a bed. This must be at least noontime of the following day. I began to bang against the metal door, staring through the barred window. Soon, some other admirable citizens joined me, and we hollered and kicked the doors. After a quarter hour jam session, a, a guard appeared uh, and uh, led me uh, into the courthouse. A large room with a, a, some kind of uh, shiny wood paneling. Well-fed woman showed up in, in a black gown, took a small polished wooden hammer and banged it on the table. She asked me to raise my hand and to swear. I swore all the judge wanted, judge wanted and, and I wanted to contribute much more, but I knew it wouldn't be wise. I had to keep uh, my right arm raised. My left one was employed in keeping my trousers from slipping down. The cops had forgotten to give back me my belt. Judging by the appearance of most of the cops and the judge, belts were not a necessity in Iowa. The judge asked me whether I was guilty of public intoxication. I'm not guilty. It's natural to be drunk. Answer my question straight. She repeated uh, the question. She seemed uh, persistent, so I agreed to plead guilty uh, to get out of the place. I had to pay 30 bucks to the cashier. A cheerful, thin woman. It was amazing to see somebody thin there. Uh, Behind the glass partition who slid me half a dozen papers to sign and with the joy and generosity of a person distributing prizes after golf tournament. I buried my signatures uh, to break uh, the incredible monotony. I got back uh, my belt and my shoelaces. I, I tried to pass the tip of the shoelace through the appropriate holes in my sneakers. My hand trembled from the hangover. I was like an old man who cannot pass a thread through the eye of a needle. A policeman observed my struggles and I looked at him angrily to mind his own holes. It was awfully bright outside so that the streets glared as coated with ice. I got to the Greyhound bus terminal, bought a gallon of spring water and sat gulping the water loudly while I waited for a bus to Sioux City. An old man sat next to me. How much rain did we get last night? He asked. I, I have no idea. Not enough, not enough. I sure hope it rains some more. Since I didn't look worried about the sub-moisture sub of Iowa soil, I had enough worries about my own sub-moisture. The old man scrutinized me and concluding I was an alien asked, how long are you staying here? Half an hour longer? If I'm lucky, just passing through. Oh, that's too bad. Our town is small, but we got some wonderful things. The most beautiful courthouse in the whole state of Iowa. Its interior is paneled in polished oak. Just beautiful. His voice had uh, become graphic patriotism. But of course, you wouldn't have seen that. I stood up shaking hands with the fellow drunk for about half a minute. With the sensation of welcome, I climbed onto a steely bus where about a dozen babies screamed for milk or maybe for beer and speed. Uh, through the tinted glass before the I-80 exit, I beheld a sight. A mobile home lay over a crushed pickup. An intact gray snowmobile stood beside them like a faithful dog waiting for its trunk master to get up from the ditch. Voila, set to, that's it. The end. That is great.
It was great. Thank you for the reading. That was wonderful. That was oh, thank always... you. Yeah. And you will be back in after Lisa's reading, and then we're going to have a lot of Q&A. So again, if people have questions, either about that story or just generally, drop them and ask a question. All right. Yosef, thanks. Thanks. In a little bit. Yeah. Okay. That was great to hear, Yosef. <laughs> All right. So now we have Lisa. Lisa Fugard is the author of Skinner's Drift, which was a New York Times notable book and finalist for the LA Times First Fiction Award. Her writing has appeared in the British Council's NW15, the Anthology of New Writing, and has been anthologized in Harcourt's textbook of world literature for high school students. She is also the author of numerous travel articles for the New York Times, and she has a story in Catamaran in this issue. So again, you can click the Buy Their Books button if you want, and you can ask a question. I am going to leave you with Lisa now, and we'll be back in a little bit. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Matt. Um, I, let me just focus it so you're not looking at my, my door. <laughs> Too bad. Um, I am going to be reading two chapters from a, a novel in progress, two short chapters. And it's interesting, you know, Yosef and I, we didn't talk about, I had no idea what he was going to be reading. But um, <laughs> when you hear the opening paragraphs of mine, you will see a certain similarity. Um, the only thing you need to know is that it's set in South Africa and it's um, 1977. So sort of the height of apartheid South Africa. Along the narrow tar road that traced the rocky stretch of coastline, the wind had picked up, tugging at her long white gauzy skirt. And now Sonia couldn't keep her head up, her hair out of her face and hitch at the same time. She stuck out her good arm, thumb cocked. Who gives a fuck if she's standing there like a mad girl, hair flying, skirt flapping? Who cares if it blows up and shows her knickers? One car went by, then another. Several minutes passed. This end of Marine Drive was not as well traveled. The fifth car stopped, a brown Ford Cortina, the driver leaning across the passenger seat to open the door, and then the wind grabbing it, swinging it wide. Sonia almost blew in. Fuss bait, you can do it, he said, as she battled to close it. A sudden stillness when she did. She pushed her hair out of her face, laughing. Thanks, hey. Beginning of North End. You going that far? He stared at her, grinning, his green eyes a jolt of color. She still carried the wind, her thoughts flying, her smile too wide, her breath gulping and loud. She leaned forward to smooth her skirt. When she straightened up, his smile vanished abruptly, and he turned too quickly to face the road. She was used to those initial moments of awkwardness when a person registered her arm, but this was a bit much. North End, she said again, and did not look at him. Yeah, yeah, I know taxi. North End it is. Sonia stared out the passenger window, Port Elizabeth sliding by, the wind silently wrenching at the palm trees, sand billowing along a deserted King's Beach. I know you, he said suddenly. Shark attack. It was in the Herald, she said. That's right. A shark, he said. I read about you. She'd resisted looking at him, but now she wanted to see what he would do with this bit of information. She wanted to make him feel uncomfortable. She turned to face him. He met her gaze. Those green eyes, a thinning hairline, and a small smile that didn't know whether it wanted to be there or not on his face. Watch it, she said. He swung hard to the right to avoid a car pulling out of a side street. Side street. He asked again where she was going. North End, I told you. You did, but where in North End? The Rio Cafe. I work near there, he said. He then took a pair of sunglasses out of the pocket of his khaki shirt and put them on, as if he were done with her. Main Street was busy as shops and offices shut for the day. Hamburger wrappers from Wimpy and other rubbish swirled in the exhaust fumes as buses loaded with African workers pulled away for their long rides back to the townships. Fashini already had some addresses in the window. When he pulled up in front of the Rio, she opened the passenger door and slipped out and did not look at him. Maybe he stayed there for a few seconds and watched her, maybe not. She didn't care an annoying ride soon to be forgotten. The Rio Cafe was a hole in the wall. Four wobbly lino top tables, a grimy window, 
a cool drink case that never kept the drinks cold enough. On the wall behind the cash register, someone had painted pictures of the cafe's offerings, including bunny chow. This was Sonia's favorite, a quarter loaf of white bread hollowed out and then filled with yellow hued minced curry. The rendering on the wall was quite accurate. Never before had Sonia eaten such luridly colored food. Upon seeing her enter, Mr. Patel quickly wiped down one of the tables, pulled out a chair, and plucked a barely cool pink stereo milk from the case. She graciously accepted his kindness. The usual, Samuel asked from behind the grill. Sonia nodded and surreptitiously sniffed the milk, still fresh. Sonia loved the Rio and its clientele. The white secretaries from local businesses in their ill-fitting dresses and too high shoes and bright blue eyeshadow. The black minibus drivers coming in for takeaways. The exuberant cashiers who worked at Clicks. Nobody with any taste, with any money would ever come in here. Her mother was a snob and Sonia had been too, only venturing this deep into North End when her mother needed to service the BMW. The disdain with which Sonia used to look at the Afrikaner girls who played hockey at Falskars High School, the rude comments she'd made about the boys from Pearson, or worse, from Dispatch, the boys with their trousers too short, half masked, hairy ankles showing. What happened? Did your budgie die? She'd whisper to her friends and they'd collapse in giggles. The shark had laid waste to all of that. Now she felt comfortable here at the Rio with its crew of going nowheres. Even with those lean, angry looking white young men, called them poor whites. She'd been nervous around men like that, but now one look at her and ach shame, they felt so sorry for her. Lunch done, she headed back outside half wishing she'd see that idiot with the green eyes because now she'd have a snappy comeback. She stood at the corner of Russell Road, <clears throat> the wind still charging through Port Elizabeth. Her mother called these the white winds, a wind that seemed to devour color, sucking the blues and greens out of the world, leaving everything spent, used up. And it was always worse in mid-afternoon. She caught another ride up to Ring Street where she moseyed around an arcade and then one more to Walmart. Neither of these drivers asked about her forearm, but that was just because she had positioned, positioned herself so, just so in the back seat. The nub of her left forearm was her currency. She spent it wisely. Tramping home on the wide path beneath the pines, she decided to see if Jeff was at the country club. She always brightened at the thought of seeing him. She'd met him when she started hitching again, a few months after the shark attack. His rusty green VW Beetle backfiring when he stopped to pick her up. His back seat was piled with boxes and she'd had to sit in the front. Some kind of tooth fastened to a strip of leather dangled from his rear view mirror. And he too had recognized her. After a few seconds of studying her face, he said, I know you, yeah. You had the high score on Lost Worlds for months. Your name was Chopping. Chopin, she said, Chopin. He's a composer. In high school, Sonia had been something of a pinball whiz, spending afternoons in the damp arcade below the Elizabeth Hotel, playing beloved Lost Worlds, trapping the ball in the flipper while the bells went wild as she ratcheted up thousands of points. She'd seen this Jeff character around. He was probably in his mid twenties, but he jolled with boys still in high school. His name had come up at a party and one of her friends said he was a Morphy. There was a rumor he had three balls. Jeff had also registered the arm. She gave him a standard response, but unlike most drivers who never ventured further into her story, he wanted more. How deep was the water, he asked. Waist deep. Was it dirty? Yes, she said warily. Early morning or late afternoon, he asked. Are you some kind of shark fundy? It was eight in the morning and that's not early. Depends, he said. For people like you maybe, but not for sharks. He laughed. She grabbed at the fang-like tooth hanging from the mirror. What's this, lion? Baboon, he said. Baboon, her turn to laugh. That shark, he asked, do you know what kind it was? A hungry one, she said. How did you get to the hospital? 
two colored fishermen drove me in their bucky. She remembered the yellow eyes of a man crouching above her, a crazy web of lines in his dark skin, his broken front teeth. She told this to Jeff, a detail she'd never told her mother. She told him how initially the shark had brushed against her and she knew right then, and she'd screamed and scrambled to get out of the water. Caught in the churning surf where the Cowie River spilled into the sea, she floundered and it had grabbed her arm and shaken her. She felt no pain, just a ferocious determination to get to shore. From the waves, she'd seen the two fishermen drop their rods and come running. One of the men had taken off his shirt and wrapped it around her bloody arm. At the stop sign, with the VW threatening to choke, Jeff turned to her. If you ever want to play pinball again, Lost Worlds, I'll take that other flipper. Did he really mean that? Did he think she would like that? All this roiled through her and then pooled into a feeling of immense gratitude. This was the kindest thing she'd heard in days. Jeff didn't ask where she was going or she forgot to tell him. He parked on a street near the rugby stadium and she lied and said she had a friend who lived nearby. She lingered by the VW Beetle while he hauled out a haversack and a tent and some stakes that he tucked under his arm. When she observed that there was no campground nearby, he said he liked camping in the bush and he disappeared down a footpath. She didn't see him for several more weeks until a drizzly winter day when she spotted the backfiring green beetle make a turn onto Villiers Road. She ran after it and then feeling foolish, stopped. Too late, he'd seen her and he seemed as pleased as she was and he pulled over. Sharky, she beamed at her new nickname. Get in, he said. She sat in the passenger seat atop a damp gray blanket and they took a dirt road that skirted the rear of the warmer country club. She learned that this was one of his favorite places to camp along with the far end of Settler Park and the turnout of Marine Drive. Since then, she'd seen Jeff at least once a week. And in all that time, he'd never made the moves on her. The Morphe rumor, the three balls, it didn't matter. She felt dog easy in his company. The comfort of being with someone whose life is worse off than yours. Jeff was always hard up for cash. He seemed to have no home, yet he got along just fine. Her mother would have been dismayed by her new best friend. And that was reason enough to keep going. Besides, they still had to play Lost Worlds. Another chapter. Johan turned left and then right, and then ended up in a narrow side street where he pulled over in the first patch of shade. Easy, easy. He needed to think clearly. He looked around, placing himself on the map. This was Chapel Street, yeah. His dentist was two blocks up the hill. The Sunland building was two blocks down the hill below Main Street. If he drove straight ahead, he'd eventually be in Sydenham. But what were the chances, hey? He wondered if he would have known she was Summerfield's daughter if he hadn't seen her arm. Maybe an inkling, because she had her father's mouth, the way she turned to him, irritated, when he asked again where she was going. A hungry mouth. Yeah, you could try hard to pinch those lips closed, to say no to the world, but it wouldn't work. He'd seen it with her father, even when he pursed his lips. That hunger was always there. She was like that, maybe. Granted, he didn't have any evidence. He hadn't been able to think too clearly with her beside him in the car. He lit a cigarette and drove to his flat in Summer Strand where he gathered his large surf rod and a few lures, no time to get bait, and then drove the short distance to the sea. Flurries of sand tore along the beach, stinging his legs. There was only one other fisherman out there, a chap like him, but with a rod the size of a telephone pole. It was foolish to be out there fishing in this wind. Any good fisherman knew this. Still, he put on his heaviest sinker and a lure used for steenbras and cast a line out. When he'd read the newspaper article about the shark attack several months earlier, a feeling of great unsettling came over Johan. He hadn't thought about Summerfield in some time. There'd been no photo of his daughter in the Herald, just the facts. Local PE girl, Sonia Summerfield, 
attacked by a shark in the shallows of Port Alfred. After a stint in hospital, she would be going home. She'd lost her left hand, but there was still time for her to take her subs in January and matriculate from collegiate. She still hoped to attend the University of Cape Town. A family with rotten luck, Johan thought. Yeah, Summerfield. If you hadn't fucked it up, then maybe your daughter... He stopped himself. The attempt to understand it all would once again prove useless. It was low tide, but with the easterly blowing hard, the surf was kicked up, wave after wave pounding to shore and crashing short. Johan cast deep, watching the lure land just beyond the break. It was a day to catch nothing. He could cast till dusk, but that was just delaying the inevitable. He knew that. His pa had taught him well. Something not sitting right with you, you look at it, you stare it in the face, my boy, and then you make a plan. Johan glanced at the other man on the beach, wondered briefly about the torment that brought him out on a windy day like this. He felt a tinge of camaraderie with the chap, then reeled in his line and headed back to his car. He drove up to the police station on Mount Road. In the file room on the third floor, where the special branch kept their files, he slid open the drawer marked R to S, rifled through some other names until he came to Summerfield, Paul. Transcripts of phone calls, hours and hours of rubbish. There was a log of his meetings with Summerfield, all detailed except for the last entry. Drove S to the airport at 4.30, waited in the parking lot until the flight took off. Johan flicked past the copy of the coroner's report from London until he came to the envelope with the photos he'd taken. He slid them out. Summerfield in front of the old Rhodes campus where he taught night school, photos with some of the ANC members from the townships. Several of them were now on Robben Island. He stopped at a photo of Summerfield coming out of the Green Dragon Chinese restaurant. A family dinner, the wife walking behind, Summerfield in the fore with his daughter on his shoulders. Yeah, even then she had the mouth. Johan looked at the date on the back. March 30th, 1966, 11 years ago. What was she now, 18 maybe? He slid the photos back in the manila envelope, closed the file drawer. Leave it now, he told himself. There's nothing there, nothing to find. Summerfield is dead. Johan was hungry and he drove down to the Rio. It was 10.30 at night and a hamburger would go down well. He double parked in front. The local police knew his car. He stepped onto the pavement and paused, remembering how he dropped the daughter here earlier that afternoon and how she'd stepped out of his car without even a thank you. The Rio? This was not the type of place for an 18-year-old girl from the well-off suburbs of Warmer to visit. This place was dirty. The food was good, but still. Was she meeting someone here? And with this question, she had turned into an enigma in her own right, not just Summerfield's daughter. Johan wanted to know more. She was a puzzle. He ordered a burger and slop chips. He ate outside, the bag of chips resting on the roof of his car. Paul Summerfield's daughter and her visit to the Rio, two interesting ones, plus a history, a messy family history. He just wanted to know more. I'll stop there. So we have time for questions. All right, we are we are back. That was great. That was great. <laughs> that was wonderful. All right, so let's get some questions in the chat. There, I will say maybe we can start off by. I'm kind of wondering why those pieces. I know when we had talked earlier, you had both been unsure what you wanted to read, and how do you pick a piece to read at a certain event? What makes you want to read it? Okay, Lisa. Well, you know, the pieces that I'm read, the, the two chapters that I read were, are from a, um, a novel that I'm very close to finishing. And it's there's a point where I suddenly just want to see what it's, you know, put it out in the world a little bit, you know, like show people my baby. So um, <laughs> that's, why, <laughs> that's why I chose those two. It's interesting because, you know, I read those two side by side, whether they will be side by side when, you know, I make the final decisions, I don't know. There's kind of a real sort of fluidity to that part of the process. Yeah. That's why I chose those two, yeah. 
What about your support about? Well, you know, actually, I wanted to read something else before, something more bombastic. Uh, <laughs> but, more bombastic. But, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, this is pretty laid back hitchhiking story, uh, <laughs> uh, jail time story. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I thought a story about beheading and stuff like that would be cool. But uh, I read it before. And... Uh, you know, I don't want to be bored while, while I'm reading my own story. So yes. I decided to read something I, I, I haven't read uh, uh, publicly except once. So that's okay. Um, uh, and uh, I was tempted to read uh, from uh, my novel in progress. And, uh, you know, but it's pretty random. I, yeah, there was just whatever no, you're feeling. Not, no, or like uh, wherever the... The thing falls, you know? Yeah. Okay. On a related question, Wendy Harris uh, has asked, what prompted you to write the piece that you read today? So maybe what is... I know that's like kind of a large question, especially when it comes to chapters from a novel. But <laughs> yeah, what do you two think? Well, uh, so many, many years ago, well, not so that many years ago, but my mom, I grew up in South Africa. My mom told a story of um, a special branch policeman who visited our house and he brought his girlfriend because they used to come and sort of check on my dad. And the woman next, the woman he brought had her arm, had been in a shark attack and was missing an arm. And that oh, woman just wow. stayed with me. She just stayed with me. And I was like, I, I'm going to, and I've changed it. It's that the relationship has shifted, whatever, but that was, that was the thing um, that just, that was what started it. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yes. How about you, Yosef? Well, uh, uh, what started for me was uh, the incredible hatred that the Americans had for the uh, Persians or the Iranians at the time, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, um, and uh, I, I just wanted to write, uh, I, I actually took out some lines, but it's uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the hitchhiking pickup. Uh, it takes place with the, this guy coming into into the pickup, and uh, all the Montana guy or whatever he is uh, is worried about it, whether he's speaking up in, in Iranian, of course, <laughs> Iranian, and uh, uh, this American uh, chauvinism, and uh, so it's totally fascinating. And uh, you know, I was hanging out in the in the in the West for a while, like Wyoming and all that. And uh, all these guys driving with the rifles in, in the pickups <laughs> in the back. So I, I just had to write a story about that, you know. Yeah, it seems like a similar instance, right? Where an encounter that just sticks with you in both cases. Well, it's it's <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing. Both stories or excerpts or whatever they start the same way. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, hitchhiking, and uh, I, I, I love how Lisa has. Uh, 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 she's so poetic. Uh, the 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 wind in her hair, you know, she's in the car and all that, but there's still the wind in her hair. Wow, amazing! Yeah, I thought that was a pretty great coincidence as well. I, I, I was so crazy. Had, it, had but... like no clue. <laughs> yeah, we, we didn't collude, but it starts the same, and uh, the theme mm -hmm. stays the same. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We have another. Uh, what's your suggestion for writers to find inspiration and jog memory of past, like events, past memories that could become stories? But Joseph, <laughs> is this like um, a, a literature question? Uh, Lisa, go ahead then. <laughs> okay, so, so, well, that's a really broad question. Okay. Um, as, so I kind of like, I'm going to like sort of like tweak it a little bit and talk about, you know, the past because there's this, you know, people, we, some of us write, bring up our past experiences or memories or whatever. And, and I just think that the things that linger, the things that you can't shake, the things that just always there, those are the things to explore, you know, and, um, and then there's that sort of. So I draw from my my experience. I mean, I'm writing about Port Elizabeth, the town that I that I you know grew up in, and I I was out there with my thumb hitching around, you know, like like two years, my last two years of high school. Um, 
but there's that process where it just turns into something else and like a character takes it and runs with it. And, but you start, I start with that as the clay. So, I mean, you know, for a long time, I kept a journal. I can't bear to do that anymore. I'm like totally journaled out. Um, but I just think it's about being awake and curious in the world. You know, that's what, yeah. that's, that's what you got to, that's where stories come from. Yeah. Just looking around. Would you say it's the same for you, Yosef, or? Well, uh, you know, the stories come from grandmothers, which was first uh, the chicken or the egg. You know, the grandmother was first, you know. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, but uh, I thought you asked me, you asked us a literary question, uh, like uh, what literary influences uh, in general stories. And, um, y you know, for me, uh, uh, I I'm sorry to say it was very mundane, uh, uh, I always found Tolstoy a little bit plodding and boring, uh, and uh, I preferred Dostoevsky, but uh, uh, I started writing because I read some uh, really disturbing stories by Tolstoy, like the death of Ivan Ilyich, uh, the long, painful description of uh, death, which violates absolutely all the current uh, literary rules, like uh, if you're writing about something, don't mention what it is. Well, it's about death, and he mentions it about a hundred times. Uh, yeah. And uh, the second one, uh, you know, so you know, my father died when I was eleven, and I was uh, really shy to write about it. And then I read the death of an age, and I said, "Well, I have a death story," so I did it. And uh, then uh, you know, fiction, nonfiction. He wrote the Luzern uh, story about street musicians. I stayed in, in uh, Basel, in Switzerland, with a bunch of Spanish street musicians. And they read, uh, and uh, then I read the, just randomly while I was staying there, I read Tolstoy, Luzern. He was a street musician. So what the <laughs> fuck? So I wrote a story about these uh, Catalan guys uh, uh, in uh, uh, Basel. And uh, so, I got two stories when I started to write about uh, an, anything from uh, from this guy whom I didn't even like, Tolstoy. I mean, <laughs> who, who likes him, really? But anyway, it was good uh, for me uh, to get there. Um, so for you, it's like the observation paired with seeing, OK, well, if this is allowed, I, I'm just going to do that. <laughs> exactly. I mean, uh, uh, Dostoevsky with ravings, like, uh, you know, it's more attractive. Yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah. So what about the editing process? We have a question here about how long does the editing process take after completing a first draft for both of you? And Lisa, how much do you anticipate your in-progress piece to change? I mean, same for you and your in-progress novel, Yosef. What is that like? I think that, um, I definitely think that the, the sort of the order of things will change, just how it gets structured. And <clears throat> one of the things that I'm one of the things that I'm doing, so the editing process takes a long time. That's just the bottom line. I'm like super slow. But one of the things that I'm doing is just looking, especially with a novel, um, you know, am I writing the same scene over and over again? You know, like, is there a scene that there's a purpose to it and I write, and then I do I have like five other very, you know, versions of that or sort of the same dynamic in the, in the book? And if they, if I do, do they need to be there? And if I don't, then out which is why I think that for me, like it's so tempting to like really get in there and like make the prose so nice, but you know, I will end up cutting stuff that I, and I don't want to belabor it too much. So um, I hope that answers a bit the question a little bit. Yeah, for me, I think, I think that, yeah, it's good. I mean, a good description of what your revision process is like. What about you? Yeah, Do you think yeah. it shifts around like that? I think, especially, Lisa, you had mentioned how you read these pieces together, but you're not even sure where they'll fall when, you know. Because, well, you know, it's like, it's like pacing. Like, when do I want the reader to know who he is, right? Because there's another character. So do I bring, is it like, when am I going to give? And then, you know, I love that. I love, like, I, I want to build tension. And so how am I going to do that with the placement of these scenes? And when does when information get revealed, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, let's see, we can also go into, uh, Yosef, are you aware to the extent that the regular events you're writing about have special resonance right now, given the politics? So yeah, given everything, I mean, 
yeah speaking of iran right now right like it's this well iran, today of all times and also but... i write a lot about uh russia and eastern europe and uh you know uh like once i had an uh, agent and i i wrote a novel about uh the russia and uh, i thought well, it's a it's a hot moment if you don't sell it now <laughs> we'll never sell it he said oh don't worry russia will always be a problem and you can always sell it because there will always be a new problem with Russia. She was so brilliant. You know, of, of course, Russia is never out of fashion. They'll always fuck up everything, you know. <laughs> so uh, so I'm not worried at all, but I, I do write about that, you know. Um, yeah. That is, yeah. I mean, I thought it was interesting, too. I was wondering if there was, like, some link between choosing to read that now or if, I mean, it's kind of an evergreen piece, as you point out, with that or with issues with Russia, right? You have this part to it. Um, I, I know, uh, well, partly because uh, America is such an antagonizing uh, yeah. uh, conglomerate of uh, peace-loving people, you know, uh, who like other peace, uh, who dislike other peace-loving people, and uh, so uh, uh, you know, it's it's incessant. Uh, it's really absurd. Uh, we're in the theater of the absurd. It's easy to be a writer. You you just can you tune into how absurd we are and. It's never going to end. It, it never began. It, it, it's always been going on, you know, like, what's yeah. the problem? We always have stories. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> on that note, what about writing schedule? Someone here has asked about writing schedule. Um, do you write every day? A lot of people are interested in this topic with the different writers. What is what is it like for you two? Well, good heavens. I wish that I wrote every day and I and I really don't there. I said it. Um, I'm, I, the, the best way to describe my process is that I really loathe routine, but I know that writers have to kind of have routine. So I have like five that I just cycle through. Like I'll write like in the evenings and then I get really bored with that and can't write in a coffee shop anymore. So I'll write in my car. I'll get very bored with that. I'll write in my, um, you know, in the morning, but I do know that. I'm aware when I'm avoiding it and I'm aware when I just don't want to do the hard work because sometimes it's really just hard work and I don't like it. Um, you know, that's the truth. Um, I'm also aware of times when it actually serves me to just take a break, step away, change the head and then come back in. Too much of that though, I totally lose the connection to the material and then it's just hard to, and then it's like, it's literally like, you know, like moving an elephant, you know, to get it going again. So it's that I, I know when I'm bullshitting myself when I'm avoiding it, but um, it's hard for me to do more than two, three hours at a time. I'm, I'm in awe of these people who write for hours. The only time I can do a long session is when I'm actually really getting close to a final revision. Um, then I can do like longer sessions. Yeah, that's me. What about you? Yes, like, do you write every day? Do you? No. Uh... I think it's fair to say I write like three times a week, uh, like a skip days and uh, uh, sometimes I write for two hours. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the world is way too more interesting uh, than my stories, you know. Uh, <laughs> suddenly there are like a million people dying, you know. Uh, like, uh, uh, can I describe uh, how the wind blows through the furs uh, or should I read about how people are dying, you know. So th there are problems with that. Um, uh, I'd love to be poetic and relaxed, uh, but uh, I'm kind of uh, worried and all over the place. And uh, so I, I don't write uh, all the time, uh, but three, four times, two, three, four times a week. Um, uh, never really that early because in the morning I, uh, I, I still wonder why I didn't die. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, like uh, a little coffee, do it, or even though it's so disgusting. Okay, so I'll have some disgusting coffee. Maybe that'll kick me, kick me up. And uh, then when I get the kick up, uh, then I say, okay. So next, uh, should I read uh, the Guardian to see uh, mm -hmm. how the pandemic is going, or should I write a little bit? So it alternates. Sometimes I write, sometimes I read how bad it is. You know? Yeah. No, that makes total sense. I think the flexibility is like what both of you seem to share on that, which I yeah. think is really interesting. Plus, we used to hitchhike, you know. 
Like, <laughs> no. that, right? yeah, that I mean, shows it's a like, where are you going to go? You know? <laughs> yeah. Now, now they say, when they put this up, they say it's great. When we put this up, give me a ride. You know, like, uh, what happened to this sign? The sign really deteriorated. Yeah. I know. Has. This it was way has. more interesting. And you had to, like, wave it a little bit. You had to, like, sort of, like, go like that to get the ride. Yeah, because, like, now uh, nobody hitchhikes. So this has become something completely new. I know. New. I know. Yeah. Yeah, I like love hitchhiking. <laughs> oh my god i think we should go back to it uh we, it, it should uh we can decrease. hitchhike across america yosef <laughs> we should do it uh, uh that would be great. Uh, we could decrease we could decrease the global warming together yeah <laughs> what about um differences between novel writing and short story writing is there a difference for you two short stories are hard for me i i just don't i don't like i don't think I, I, they're, they're hard. They're hard for me. Let Yosef can answer that. There's no difference for me. You know, uh, mm. uh, for me, it's sentence uh, to sentence. And uh, if they accumulate enough and go on, uh, maybe it'll become a novel. And if not, uh, maybe it'll be uh, a story. Maybe it'll be a chapter. And I love what Francine Prose said that uh, she, uh, she wrote short stories at first, and she was so scared of the concept of the novel. And then she um, said, okay, let me pretend that the short stories are chapters of a novel, you know, and, uh, but it can go the other way around. So let me pretend that uh, what I'm writing is a novel, but if it stops short, it's a short story, you know? No, I think that's, yeah. I, I love that. A way to think about it. You just write it and then it's done. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it, it, it's, if you're prefabbing it, uh, fuck it, you know? Yeah, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Great advice. All right. Um, for the final question, why don't someone had mentioned the time period? So, Lisa, why did you choose 1977 as the time period? And Yosep, what is the time period of your piece? What 1981. Do you Reg Regonomic, uh, Regonomics. Ooh, that's so wild. There you go. I mean, they're, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You would think it was planned, but. <laughs> Not at all. Um, 1977, I think it was a time when. <laughs> white people in South Africa could still sort of live in this place of kind of, kind of like a sort of like an easy ignorance, you know, in the eighties, it was harder because, you know, the state of emergency was declared. There was so much, you know, I mean, the struggle had really intensified, but in the seventies, it was still sort of happening over there. And so, and I wanted to really write about that time period especially with young people in South Africa, like, you know, teen, like, you know, 18, 17, 18, 19. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I kind of miss that era when, uh, when the world started to slip down and now we have, we are really, uh, I mean, we snowballed, we are about to crash and, uh, uh, but when it started to go down in the, during ergonomics, uh, there's still innocent corruption, and uh, yeah. n now uh, I I remember it fondly, you know, like hitchhiking. <laughs> Everything was new, mm -hmm. and yeah. so I mean, I'm old, so obviously. But you were also young then, Yosef. So I mean, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I mean. <laughs> no, but I do think that's interesting that at the start, setting your piece at like the start of like neoliberalism taking hold, and then now it's been it has this draining effect where, yeah. You, you say it's not as interesting as it was then, hitchhiking across the country. Well, yeah, I, I don't think I can do it, really. Uh, plus, <laughs> uh, people in general have, um, I mean, the mean, means of transportation, that, that's the whole evolution of uh, our, our globe has been uh, the means of transportation. So people can get around much more easily now than uh, even uh, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, you know. So uh, nobody really bothers to hitchhike yeah yeah i mean but maybe we should all start a story with hitchhiking and see where it goes let's just um but i, I mean i think it is an, it's a nice connection there between the stories i like how that worked out uh, amazing <laughs> uh, it was crazy when i heard you read i was like oh my gosh <laughs> we should all this part. except i didn't have the wind in my in my head oh, well no, yeah, I, but, but you I, I don't even wind. I don't even have my hair now, but uh, you know, your, the, your protagonist had the wind in her hair, and then uh, <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, man, but you had such killer dialogue, Yosip. Oh my God. I mean. <laughs> that was great. Yeah, really. All right, and I, I wrote think... I wrote a line that totally impressed me, but my handwriting is so bad I can't even read it now. But there was a <laughs> there was a highly poetic line, Lisa, that you wrote uh, there, and uh, I, I I I can't read it. <laughs> sure, that's good. Okay, thank you both for the reading. It was it was great. I love how it worked out. Um, remember, everyone, you can buy their books with the book or with the button at the bottom. Um, and that will take you to our bookstore. We can get signed copies. We also have the talks tomorrow, so make sure to check it out. And if you want to watch any of the videos on demand, you can do that also here on Crowdcast. All right. Thank hey, you, everyone. Thank you, everybody, thank you for both. coming in and listening, too. You know? Oh, yeah. My God. You have so many comments. So... Yeah. Thank we have yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. And uh, see, you, see you all. Uh... See you next year at Catamaran and maybe tomorrow at the reading. <laughs> oh, yeah. Unless we have a new pandemic, you know. We think this is the last pandemic. No, no, no. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cheers, guys. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much, Matt. <laughs> yeah, no worries.